I started Surviving Sky with the goal of bringing more awareness to my sister Sky's disappearance. And I thought the best way to do this would be to start a podcast. That way I can really get into the details and bring some humanity to this case. The truth is, I didn't know how to start a podcast. So when I discovered Spotify for podcasters, it had everything I needed. I could record, edit, and then send it out to all the streaming platforms out there. I didn't need to take too much time getting hung up on the, all the technical aspects. So if you're out there and you're listening to this and you have something that you're passionate about and you just feel like you can inform the world <laughs> about what you know, then why not start a podcast and check out Spotify for Podcasters today. The first 48 hours are critical when somebody goes missing. But no one even realized that Sky was missing until after 48 hours. This is episode one of Surviving Sky, the first 10 days. It was April 1st, 2008. It started off like any other day. I was at work. At the time, I was working at the Red Cross and I was working at their blood drives. I was with a blood donor doing their vital signs when all of a sudden I just didn't feel that well. There was something wrong with my vision. I couldn't see clearly out of my right eye. I excused myself and let my supervisor know what was going on. Then I proceeded to just have a seat and wait it out. I quickly realized that this just wasn't going to go away. So I let my supervisor know, who thankfully was a nurse. So she said to either go home take it easy, or go to the hospital. At that point, I called my mom. Yeah, of course, when you're sick, you call your mom. (laughs) I was 24, I lived at home, and I wanted to let them know what was going on. I didn't feel confident driving home, but luckily there was a hospital within a half mile, so I told my mom I was heading over there, and she said she'd meet me. By the time I got to the emergency room, my symptoms were worsening. My vision was cloudy. My words? I was, I was forgetting my words. Can't remember if the emergency room was even busy that day, but I remember getting seen very quickly. Everybody seemed really concerned. They quickly needed to rule out if I was having an aneurysm or a stroke. At some point, my mom arrived, and after that, my dad arrived. A CAT scan was done. I had a lumbar puncture done. I remember my dad having to hold me in place so they can get the <laughs> the needle in my spine. I was there for a few hours and they were able to successfully rule out both a stroke and an aneurysm. And eventually they just settled on an atypical migraine. It was late evening when I was discharged. We all went home. I remember going straight to bed. Everyone was exhausted by the events. I can't remember if I ate dinner, if anybody ate dinner. I just remember I was exhausted and felt awful and I just needed to sleep it off. I remember the next morning I still wasn't feeling well. I call out of work. I couldn't stand without feeling extremely dizzy. So most of the morning I just stayed in bed. The dizziness was unrelenting, and soon enough, the whole day was again focused around me and what was happening. I remember my mom calling the primary care doctor, explaining what was happening, and he told her to just have me wait it out, and if anything else were to happen, to go back to the ER, because there was probably something wrong with the lumbar puncture. And during this time, I remember my mom being really concerned about me, focused on me during this. She had also mentioned that Skye was actually staying with a friend at school. She was there since the 31st, and now it was the 2nd. And I feel like she kind of lost track of time and couldn't really remember when Skye was going to be coming home. It's now April 3rd, and I have to go back to the ER because there were several failed attempts at my lumbar puncture, and I was having spinal fluid leak, and I needed to have a blood patch done. So essentially, I had to have another lumbar puncture done in order to fix (laughs) the failed lumbar puncture. Now, I have to be honest. We as humans are not perfect. So at this point, my timeline is a little fuzzy. Two trips to the ER and over a decade later, I mean, 
Can you blame me? The, everything <laughs> at this point is going to become super high stress. But I believe it was the evening of April 3rd when my mom had asked everybody if we had seen Sky. Sky was 21 years old and she went to Central Connecticut State University. It was only about 15 minutes away from her home in Southington, so she was a commuter student. She had made a handful of friends in school with similar interests in anime, manga, and Japanese culture in general. Sky's love for the Japanese culture could be traced back to her pre-teens, but this often left her alienated in middle school and high school, so college was a different experience for her. She finally found people that she could relate to. But if I'm being honest, I remember meeting a few of her friends, and it often felt like they still didn't know Sky. They were new friends. They just didn't know her that well. And Sky's anxieties were really apparent to me. But I don't think that these new people really recognized it for what it was. So in a way, even though she had this new group of people, she still was kind of an outsider. So when a few days before Skye had told my mom that she was going to be staying a few days at one of her friend's dorms, my mom was kind of excited. Skye was an introvert, so it was nice to see her going out and doing things and actually having friends. So back to the evening of April 3rd, I believe my mom just kind of brushed it off and figured she would call around the next day give my sister some space because, hey, she was 21 and nobody wants their mom calling for them, especially if it's like their first time heading out and having friends and actually having like an adult life. On April 4th, it was a Friday. I don't remember how I was feeling. I think I was feeling a little bit better at this point. I can't remember if I was, went to work, but I remember it was probably the afternoon when my mom was making phone calls to Skye's friends. She had just a few of Skye's friends' phone numbers, and from there, whoever she called, she would get more phone numbers from. But within a few phone calls, it became very apparent that no one had seen Skye around. It was as if Skye had told one friend that she would be somewhere else and then told that other friend that she was going to be somewhere else so nobody had seen her for a few days nobody could remember the last time they actually saw her now i know what you're thinking why can't we just call sky sky didn't have a cell phone <laughs> i remember yeah she was a college student she was kind of out on her own but she really didn't have an interest in having a cell phone and it wasn't ever pushed as a safety device from my parents. I remember I got my first cell phone back in high school, probably 2001. And I got it because all my friends had it, you know, to be honest. That's why I wanted it. And of course, I was going to be going off to school and I wanted to be in contact with people. My family was just kind of slow adapters to new technologies. And I know it's 2008 in this era <laughs> and it's not a new technology but yeah my sister didn't have a cell phone my parents didn't have a cell phone to this day my brother still doesn't have a cell phone so on the afternoon of april 4th it became very apparent that nobody knew where sky was this isn't to call up my parents in any way but my parents don't deal well with stress anything that breaks their normal routine to be honest, they have been living in the same town for, I don't know, 40 years. And I've definitely seen them use their GPS just to get around town. So that's just kind of the picture I want to paint. <laughs> so when you're put in a situation where you don't know where your child is and you, you are that type of person, things don't go smoothly. My mother made the call to the police. She stated that nobody had seen Sky for the past few days, and the police assured her that probably nothing to worry about, and they would be sending an officer over shortly. I remember the waiting 
waiting for the officer to come to our home. And I feel like it felt like forever. And we all kind of just like went about just keeping ourselves busy. And it must have been a few hours before the officer even showed up to take a statement. It was during this time where my mom was going through Sky's room for a few things. And this was when my brother discovered the email. He had access to her Sky's email through his computer because every once in a while she would use his computer. He had a computer in the basement. It was a desktop. And a lot of times they spent time together playing video games in the basement. So from time to time, she would log in on his computer and her email passwords were saved. And this is when things get serious. Because before that, we were thinking maybe like Sky was with a different friend, a friend we didn't know about. And maybe, you know, we couldn't necessarily rely on the other friends that we had been in contact with because, you know, Sky was still out there trying to find out who she was. So, you know, giving her the space at this time was kind of what she needed. So there were, you know, it, the worry, the stress was there, but it wasn't as intense until we found the email in her account. And the email was the itinerary, the flight itinerary to Japan that was dated on April 1st, 2008. Now, again, my timeline is a little fuzzy, but I believe that this all happened prior to the police officer actually getting there. So when the police officer got there, he was not, (laughs) not a cordial man. He just kind of was going through the procedures. That's kind of, I don't ever want to politicize anything, but police officers are just policy enforcers, whether they believe in the policies or not. That's kind of their job. So he was just there to take a statement and kind of reassured my parents that oh this is just a normal thing sometimes they run off but the thing is even though sky was 21 that wasn't her temperament you know so when like police officers say this type of thing or when you see these type of things happen in like tv shows or the movies it's like they assume that everybody's kind of the same at that cert- at that age or whatever and that isn't true that is something i totally want to stress like what you see and what you assume people to be is not who they are like just take a second (laughs) and really think about that something else i want to point out is that as i'm telling you this recollection all these memories they're my memories so i am not going over notes with my parents right now. I have had some conversations just to kind of like jog my memory. But overall, I feel as though like I'm going to have to re-listen to everything and (laughs) probably revise in later episodes to kind of put some pieces together. And I think in doing it this way, it's going to be an interesting way to look at you know, human nature and memories and what trauma does to to the way you think. Um, Because I keep, before I say anything, I keep trying to remember the order of of events, especially when it comes to discovering the email, the police coming to the house. Because like, I keep going back and forth. I keep thinking that the police officer came, we gave a report, and then we found the email. And, but another part of my memory is telling me that it happened and it's, I can't tell if I'm merging two events together. If the police officer came back, you know what? Now that I'm talking through this, we didn't find the email until after the first time the police came. So, yes, (laughs) this is like an interesting I think way to do this (laughs) but yeah the police officer came and my mom gave the report he wasn't very nice about it and then it wasn't until after 
when my brother discovered the email. That's exactly, yeah, that's exactly what happened there. My brother, yep, he found the email and the itinerary. And at that point, we contacted the police again. And I believe they came over a little bit quicker. And the police officer was a little nicer because this was now a totally different situation. This wasn't what he assumed it would be with a angsty young adult kind of doing their own thing, maybe with a boyfriend or whatever, just ran off. Um, as far as I know, Sky never even had a boyfriend. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just we have to stop assuming that people of certain ages or certain demographics behave a certain way. Like, it's not okay because it can really impede the progress of a case like this. You know, when there's just assumptions made about people, it, just, it doesn't help. It doesn't help the family because then you, the family's often thinking, what did we miss? What more did we miss? Now, I'm sure I personally have had secrets from my family. You know, it's part of growing up, but it's nothing nefarious. It's nothing to be concerned over, like I would leave or whatever. But yeah, it was the second time. There was a second incident when the police came back, when we had a bit more information. And I believe the police officer kind of just said, oh, maybe check the airport. There really wasn't much the police could do. Knowing that or trying to figure out if she did go to Japan. Like that was the first thing. Did she actually go to Japan? And even, yeah, even in that situation, the police really had very little jurisdiction as to what they could do. Because this was the Southington police. In order to do anything um, with the airport, you had to get at least the state police or the FBI involved. This was just something a little bit bigger than a local police department could handle. So again, this is another incident where I'm not too sure about the timeline exactly. It was after the second police officer came. He suggested that we go to the airport to find her car at least because her car had been gone with her. So he, I guess, was going to be doing whatever he did on the back end of policing. <laughs> and we were told to just go to the airport and find the car. So it was my dad, my mom, me, and it was my boyfriend at the time who is currently my husband. <laughs> and we went to Bradley International Airport. And I believe we had contacted, when we got there, we contacted some like parking garage um, attendants or whatnot to see if there was any like cameras or anything like that. They didn't seem all too concerned and they were just like hey yeah just look around the lots see if you find her car and it wasn't it's not a big airport it's not a big parking lot it all just depended on where she was parking so if she parked next to the terminals it's not that big it's maybe four to five floor parking garage and just like an outside area that adjacent that held maybe another like 100 cars so in the grand scheme of things, not super big if you were like looking at other airports. And we went like floor by floor, row by row, looking for her car. And we, were, we weren't ever instructed to just hold off if we found the car in case there was any evidence or anything like that. It was just find her car. And I don't remember exactly how long it took us to find her car, but we did eventually find her car. And we got to the car, we looked in it, and there was a coat in there, just a few like normal things that you would find in somebody's car, a car that they use like for everyday use. Um, and that was it, like it just looked normal. There was just like, a few things left behind and it just was confusing. 
but we were never told to like not touch anything or anything like that. If the, I don't even think the police looked at her car to see if there was any kind of evidence or anything like that. I can't remember if that even happened. It was just, there was four of us there and we took her car back. We just got in the car and paid the car, like the, the parking um, fee. <laughs> and we just drove it home. And finding the car at the airport did give us good reason to believe that she actually went to the airport and went to Japan. I also have this memory of walking through the airport and one of us asking like if she got to Japan, but I'm not too sure if this is even true. It's so funny what memories and trauma can do. Um, I'm gonna have to revisit this one later. So the car was found, we brought it home, and then it was late at this point, maybe 11, midnight, I can't recall, and I believe there was another, there, the police called at this point to let us know that it was confirmed that she went to Japan, but that was where things kind of ended for the police in Southington in the state of Connecticut, that this was gonna be now a larger case. And in order to move forward, we had to go to Japan to start the paperwork over there, to start filing a missing persons report. The Southington police, the Connecticut police, the FBI does not have jurisdiction in Japan. In order to make this official, we had to go. This is the moment when my family's limitations are on full display. My father's angry and confused. My mother's a nervous wreck. My brother, quiet, withdrawn. But this wasn't out of the ordinary. I remember leaving my parents to look up some flights to get some more information. My parents didn't have passports. I was the only one in the household who had a passport. And to be honest, I felt oddly energized to help out in this way. In a way, I felt proud of my sister I was like wow like I was known as kind of the troublemaker the wild child of the family even though I in the grand scheme of things I wasn't that crazy <laughs> but in a family of introverts and shy scared people like I was the one that broke the rules and it was in that moment that I was like wow like Sky's doing something. She is breaking out. And I felt proud of her. So I kind of wanted to be there in Japan when we found her so I could kind of give her a high five. I'm like, wow, you really like, you went above and beyond trying to break out of that like depressive cycle that we as an entire family have been dealing with our entire lives. All of the negative thoughts and all of the what-if possibilities hadn't even crossed my mind yet at this point. We, I assumed that we would find her, that we were going to Japan, and we're going to be reunited. We're going to find Sky, and everything's going to be okay. Like This was my mentality, so I was all for going to Japan and getting this investigation going and during this time I also had gotten a new job a new freelance job with MTV they had started this new like street team type of thing for the 2008 election and I was representing Connecticut and I felt as though hey I have these connections now maybe they have some pull in Japan. I don't know what I was thinking, really, but I was just thinking anything, you know, because I don't know what we were about to get into. So with some discussion, it was decided that I was going to go and my mom was going to go. My father decided not to go because he had a heart condition. And there was, I remember there being a sense of relief on his face to not have to go. Again, I had said this earlier, they are creatures of habit. 
and this was a type of stress that was eventually and is still slowly but surely tearing them apart now the first order of business was to get my mom a passport we had to get it expedited obviously we know how bureaucratic the u.s system is and how it can take weeks months to get a passport so the police had arranged for us to get the passport expedited we needed to go to another facility down in norwalk connecticut that processed expedited passports and due to our situation this would be possible but again more fear and anxiety came in when they realized they had to go to norwalk connecticut and i know what you're thinking <laughs> um it's still in connecticut it's about an hour drive so what's the big deal but to people i need to stress this to people who are full of anxiety and unable to break out of their comfort zone, this added more stress. So when my father decided that he wasn't going to go to Japan, there was relief. But now on top of it, now they need to go down to Norwalk. And my, he couldn't let my mom go alone. And my mom couldn't go alone. So they had to go together. And it's just, it's, it's this whole, when they're together, it's the, the anxieties. It just feeds off each other. And it's just this like endless cycle of anxiety and nervousness and anger that just brews between them. And they've been together for 30 plus years at this point and maybe in their older age it looks endearing <laughs> but in a situation like this it just it adds another layer at this point my days are getting fuzzy but i know in order to expedite the passport it still wasn't going to be like a same day type of turnaround an appointment still had to be made they had to go down to norwalk they had to be like interviewed and it still took a few hours so at this point it may be a few days before we're able to get everything finalized the plane tickets were bought i can't remember if we had a hotel booked at this point or if that was done later i think we did book it again memory is oh this is such a fascinating thing it was also during this time where I remember feeling a lot better from the trips I had to the ER, but I did have another doctor's appointment because I had this nail fungus on my thumb. <laughs> and I remember I went down and I, they removed my thumbnail. They just like numbed up the digit and removed it. And then I was on my way. And all of this happened before having to board like an 18 hour flight to Japan. So several spinal taps, a new diagnosis of migraines and <laughs> losing my thumbnail. <laughs> Circling back to the police, I remember it was probably the fifth or the sixth when the police officer came back to our home and he apologized for his behavior in the beginning. He knew he was being cold and dismissive of this. And it wasn't until later when he saw the dread and the fear and the panic on my parents' faces that he knew that this was a much serious situation. And while we appreciated the gesture, the apology I, <laughs> to this day, my mother does not like the police. It was April 10th when my mother and I finally boarded the flight to Japan. My father dropped us off at the airport. Um, I can't remember if my brother came or not. And I remember knowing my mom. She's a sweet woman, but in a state of anxiety, of high stress, 
she already has a speech impediment. So in high stress situations, it becomes so much worse. And she becomes almost catatonic. She's oblivious to a lot of things. And again, not being an adventurous person, getting on an airplane, like I can't remember the last time she was on an airplane. I believe I was 13 <laughs> prior to this when we went to Florida on a, on a family vacation. So it's 2008. And the last time she was on an airport was probably like 1994. So going into an airport, again, dealing with, you know, the disappearance of her daughter, like that's a high stress situation. And I remember trying to just be as helpful and as like being the bigger person and taking charge and just to make my mom's life a little easier and not to add stress. I remember wearing the brightest color hoodie I've owned. It was like neon yellow and pink and green just because I know that in a state of high anxiety, my mom can kind of become a little oblivious. So I didn't want her to get lost and I didn't want her to lose me. That's like another thing you just don't want to add when you're trying to find somebody already. And I wore this ridiculous sweatshirt just to keep her a little calmer, just so she would be able to spot me in a crowd. Like if one of us had to use the bathroom, when it got kind of turned around. I just, it's little things like that. Like I remember having to keep in mind and I remember just trying to ensure that everything was going to be okay and we got this and we're going to find Sky. And yeah, and then that began our journey to Japan. We flew into Tokyo and from there, I remember, I believe we had to get off and we met with some, again, the memory thing. I can't remember if it was in if it was our connecting flight, we had a few connections. I believe one was in California and then another was in Tokyo and then another, I think that might've been it. Then we went to Sapporo. So as I'm trying to piece this together, I believe it was when we landed in Sapporo. Then we were met with um, the ambassador and the authorities and we were after an 18 hour flight or whatnot, um, we were taken into a, like almost like an interrogation room in the airport. And that's when we began our, like giving them our, our story and filing the missing persons report. And I remember, oh God, it's just the complete and utter culture shock. There was like bowing and, I remember just my mom just stood there just completely in a daze and I was just like oh my god we're like if we came here and we're all the first thing we do is like we're offending them we're offending them with our presence because my mom was in a state where she just the reality set in we were in a completely different world right now and she didn't know where to go she didn't know what to do so this is when I kind of like took the reins and I did all the talking. I don't think my mom said a word. And if she did, it was just exacerbated by her stutter and nothing came out. And, and it was hard to read the faces of the police officers, of the investigators, because culturally, like, it's different. It is. And there's no time within... <laughs> 10 days to become educated in another culture. And we learned very quickly that we were out of our element and everything we did just seemed to offend them. Like these brash, big American women are here to insult them. Oh man, it was so overwhelming. And I couldn't I don't know if I was speaking too fast or if things were getting lost in translation, but it was such a blur. Like, I don't even know. I can't remember how we got from the airport 
to our hotel. It's, it's a blur. I can't remember the time of day. And I can't remember the next steps. I believe we went, the ambassador had escorted us to our hotel. But again, I'm, I'm also remembering like a bus ride or a train ride. No, it was a train ride. Oh my God, this is insane. <laughs> um, yeah, the ambassador encom- accompanied us on the train over to the hotel got us there we checked in and then i think the next day we we were informed to go to the embassy it's april 10th 2008 10 days after sky boarded her one-way flight to japan my mother and i have finally made it to japan we filed the police reports and then we wait. 10 days is a very long time before you can really start a missing persons investigation. 10 days is almost too late. Once we were in Japan, the reality set in. This wasn't going to be a vacation. Though at first, the first few days, the excitement almost the adrenaline that comes with um being put in a situation like this makes it feel like you're actually living for the first time i was the one that was supposed to stay positive and keep my mother kind of like uplifted there wasn't much we could do the first few days we were there it was up to the police to kind of do their due diligence and do what they do. We were Americans out of the element in a new, brand new world to us. We didn't know where to begin. We didn't know the layout of the land. We didn't know the culture. There wasn't anything we could really do. So as I sit here today, I try to go over what we could have done differently. And given the circumstances, the the medical issues that I was having during the time she left, I don't know if that could have been avoided. And it's something that I think about to this day because what keeps this kind of event on the forefront, other than it just being absolutely insane, is the fact that this has caused my body to remember the trauma of losing her. And without fail, every year since 2008, I have had those migraines the same time around April 1st, every year. It's insane. It's this connection that remains with me today. It's this connection that has shaped my views on so many things and how things work in this world. These migraines I get keep me connected to her, keep the story and keeps me reliving these traumas. It also kind of gives me hope, like maybe in this (laughs) insane world, maybe there's this connection that she's still out there that she's still trying to reach out i don't know it's <laughs> it's complicated and it's maybe my own personal way of dealing with this but yeah that was the first 10 days